I had just moved back to Cincinnati and I had gotten an NEA grant, which was, um, I was kind of a Cinderella story because I had quit my job not knowing what was gonna happen to me. And I moved back here and I got a grant. It was the second grant I had ever gotten in my life. Someone in Louisville had found out about this woman that nobody knew who had gotten an NEA and they decided to figure out who I was and invite me. This was the University of Louisville, and actually it was Suzanne Mitchell who taught there for many, many years, but she did a little research, invited me to come down and speak to a class. I was invited down there to give a talk, and Suzanne had known Cal for many, many years, and she was putting Since together... the 70s. Yeah, and you know, she's a really wonderful photographer, and she invited some people to come to dinner. So she had invited Cal to come to Louisville to hear this woman nobody knew, <laughs> we just moved to Kentucky, and... <laughs> and I said, why would I want to come to Louisville to hear a photo lecture? <laughs> so it was a potluck dinner they threw for yeah, you. Yeah, after I gave my little talk where Cal proceeded to pepper me with questions, which I guess I must have survived. <laughs> and so we met at a dinner in Louisville. A photogram is kind of, is a negative image. When you place an object on license and paper, the light doesn't go through the object, it goes around it. So even when you're using something recognizable, you have a certain layer of abstraction kind of built in because of the process. So I would say that my work is rather contemplative. I remember making these big sled photograms and people didn't know they were sleds. They thought they were giant insects. And I think sometimes even the dress photograms look a little like jellyfish. I mean, they don't always look literally like a dress. So there's a certain kind of strange transformative thing that goes on with a photogram. Um, my work, because I, I like to work with multiple panels, starts getting large. The other thing I think that's interesting about the photogram is that your image is the same size as the object. So if you're using clothing, it's the size of a human being. Um, so when you confront my work, it's the same size that you are, which is something I've always thought was really wonderful about the photogram process. I've often been very interested in photographs, the dimensional quality of photographs, the photograph as an object. It's not just an illusion. Maybe it's got some dimensionality to it. It's got some substance to it. Or it's got a, a really illusion, a more of illusion to the three-dimensional world. Uh, so, you know, that's certainly got me into collage. You know, a lot of work that I did with cutting up photographs, reassembling them. My background in photography is both very personal and very academic. Um, my parents were writers and photographers, so I really grew up around photography. Um, I got my first camera when I was 11. It was called a Primo Junior, which was kind of like a baby Rolleiflex, and I was taught to develop film right away. So at the age of 11, I was developing two and a quarter film. A friend of mine, Chris Burnett, uh, with whom I had gone to graduate school, but he wound up in Boston too, gave me a box of printing out paper, which is a kind of paper that went back before the turn of the century, I mean the 19th to the 20th, um, and it's sensitive to ultraviolet light, it's sensitive to sunlight as opposed to the incandescent light of a little larger. So you can make photograms outside. You also don't have to process it right away. You can see the exposure happening so you know what you have. You can put your paper away in a light tight box and gold tone it and fix it later on, which turned out to be a great way for me to work um, because I'd make some exposures and I'd do a little darkroom work later on whenever I could. And um, I thought it was something I would just do for a short period of time um, as a kind of stopgap method and I wound up working that way until 2009 when the paper got discontinued. Chris Burnett gave me a box of 20 by 24 printing out paper that he thought was completely out of date. So he started me off with the largest size that the paper comes in. And I had never worked that big, but you know, it was, it, it was the late 80s when everybody was starting to work really big and I was really excited because I always worked kind of small. And so I started working with just objects on hand, just whatever I could find. But as I worked more and more with the process, I was using chairs, I was using 
sleds. I was using a lot of objects that I thought related to the body. The body wasn't there, but they were objects that kind of extended the body. And, I, and they were, I was picking objects that I thought cast really nice shadows. I was, I was looking for shape. I was looking for shape, but in content, I think I was, I was kind of dancing around the body in, in a lot of ways. Um, and I started making a lot of multi-paneled pieces. 20 by 24 wasn't big enough. And, and I also, well, I was finding objects that I was really interested in that were bigger than the paper. So I was taping all these pieces of paper together and working um, with either, very near either doors or windows so that I could get big shafts of sunlight. And I would use the doors and windows or window shades as my shutter to let in the sun because you had to work with really strong sunlight. And so I was mostly working, making my real exposures between May and October. Um, in, in the winter, the sun, sunlight isn't as strong and you really need crisp, you couldn't get really crisp delineations in the middle of the winter. So that's what I do my darkroom work. Uh, I was fortunate in a lot of ways. Um, I had two older brothers that were sculptors, and, um, and one studied uh, Southern Illinois University with Bucky Fuller, the other one was an Art Institute of Chicago guy. So I had, I had that family sort of art lineage, which really helped me a lot, I think. It sort of gave me a, a future in the arts. I didn't really want to go into studio arts at first. But I did, and uh, I actually majored in architectural history. And, uh, but part of that component was you had to take all the studio classes. So I sort of had you know, two directions going. And you know, my dad was a factory worker, and, uh, but he was very supportive for the family. Whatever anybody wanted to do, he was behind it 100%. He never even finished grammar school. He had a as a child had to start working in grammar school to help support the family in Chicago. So I grew up in Chicago and it was a great, for me, I just loved it. I loved growing up. The city was my playground. The city itself was such a wonderful um, background on so many levels that uh, it's probably why we go back to Chicago now five, six times a year. I can't quite let go of Chicago even though I've been in Cincinnati now far longer than I was in Chicago. The first book I did was uh, Mr. Spoons. Uh, when, I, when I moved here, I was really taken with Over the Rhine, the architecture and Over the Rhine. And at the time, Over the Rhine was filled with Appalachian bars, and they, most of them had good bluegrass music in them, uh, especially Aunt Maudie's was the real hangout spot. In comes Mr. Spoons, selling corsages, little flowers wrapped in cellophane, and then he would play the spoons. And I was so fascinated by that. So I met him, we started talking, and I said, let's, let's photograph for a year and see what we come up with. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I kept at it, and for a year I photographed him and went to all the Appalachian bars. And the guy threw it, put it all together, and did the book, book full of spoons. And it comes with a, a 45 record and a, and a chapter on how to teach yourself to play the spoons. And then I photographed, the other artist book I did was uh, um, T-shirts are tacky, where I hung all around the baseball field, night games, and I photographed people with just crazy sayings on their T-shirts. So I, did, and I dedicated that book to the bicentennial then. And that was uh, 1976. And then the one after that, I was in Chicago, that horrific snowstorm in 79, 78, 79, and uh, went around and photographed all the, con all the, to me, appeared to be conceptual installations where people save their parking space, uh, which they now call dibs. You know, people put out a chair or a bucket or build things. To, if they dig out their snow parking spot, they want to save it. And uh, so I went around Chicago and photographed all that. And that was the book, This Space Reserved. But it was fun. I thought, for me, it was an avenue because really, I was really sort of taken by the whole fluxus activity of artists really reaching out, and artist books, certainly, of um, artists producing their own work 
and sharing it inexpensively with other artists. And that was a lot of fun in those days, in the 70s, where people were doing all kinds of crazy little books and just swapping them and trading them. And the early books were all offset lithography, and, and I worked with Young and Klein, which was a wonderful printer in those days, where Melvin Greer actually worked uh, early on in his career. Uh, and they were wonderful. They, they were wonderful to work with, and they sort of enjoyed having artists sort of come out and do stuff that was not like big commercial jobs. I attended uh, the Institute of Design, which is at the Illinois Institute of Technology, which is a long title, but it's in Chicago. So at 18, I left Greater Cincinnati and moved to Chicago. And I studied with some really amazing people. The ID was the American descendant of the Bauhaus. But I did get to study with people like Aaron Siskind right before he retired, uh, and some of the people who had studied with him, like Joe Jockna and uh, Joe Sterling and so forth. And um, I started out thinking I was going to be a graphic designer, but I realized that it was the photography part of every project that I really enjoyed. So by the end um, of my college years, I was studying with Arthur Siegel. I was determined to go to graduate school. I didn't want to work in dark rooms forever. So I, um, I wound up at the University of New Mexico. I spent four years in Albuquerque, uh, and I thought I would get this really different perspective on photography, and I walked into Thomas Barrow's office. He was my graduate advisor, and there was a huge Aaron Siskin photograph sitting above his desk, and guess where he had gone to school? So, you know, I left Chicago, but I really didn't get away. I studied with Tom, and I studied with Betty Hahn. It was very experimental, you know, you're all, we're all kind of descendants from Laszlo Maholi Naj. And, but in between an undergraduate and graduate school, I actually did a lot of street photography, believe it or not, in, in Chicago. And it was, it was really how I explored my city, it was really how I got to know Chicago. And then when I went to college, and uh, I ended up actually doing a lot of architectural photography. And uh, one of the professors was really big on Frank Lloyd Wright and being in Chicago, it just panned out. And I won a competition to uh, photograph all the Frank Lloyd Wright buildings in Oak Park with this professor, Herman Punt, and he was just from Germany, and he just loved Frank Lloyd Wright. But the great thing was we got to go to all the Frank Lloyd Wright houses, and then we get to meet all the families, and then most of the families would invite us to stay for dinner. You know, I was green as they could be about technical stuff, but uh, somehow I pulled it off. So I sort of always had this foot in the door with photography a little bit, but not on a self-expressive side. I was sort of just using it for documentation. And then I decided uh, I'd go to graduate school at the Institute of Design in Chicago, so that's what I did. I applied for a conscience objector and somehow got it in Chicago in the neighborhood that I grew up in, which I was the third one ever in that neighborhood ever to get a CO status. And then I ended up at Evanston Hospital, which is just north of Chicago, doing films. I, I did films of operations and medical photography, which I wasn't trained for. But because I had a photography background, they sort of slipped me into it, and I sort of learned as you go in the operating room. So that was fabulous. I spent three years just enthralled by it. And I'll never forget the first surgery I did was an orthopedic surgeon, and he knew I had never been in an operating room in my entire life. So he talked me through the whole thing, and I was so fascinated by it. I mean, I was just enthralled by it. And I uh, did that for two years. And so I started making these combination prints that were part photogram and part photograph. So I was still kind of roaming the streets of Albuquerque, but I was photographing, I wasn't photographing people. I was photographing architectural details. And I was creating these elaborate photogram borders in the darkroom. And a photogram is made without a camera by placing objects right on your light sensitive paper. And I was working in color. I was making Cibachrome prints. Dwayne Michaels, uh, we early on brought Dwayne Michaels to Cincinnati because I had asked, the, my first year of teaching, I asked the students, uh, you know, who would you find interesting to come and lecture? And somebody found his first book, Sequences. And they said, this guy. And they didn't really know who he was. And I said, oh, great, now i got to call him. 
So I ne I'll never forget that, just sitting there looking at the phone. I said, now I got to call Dwayne Michaels in New York and talk to him. And of course, the phone rings. He picks up the phone. We have this conversation. I said, you were voted by the students. I said, we don't have much money. We have $250. We'll pay for your flight. He came and stayed three days in a loft downtown with students. And we just, we had a fab, as anybody would with him, because he's so energetic. We had a, just a wonderful stay with him. And then he said, let's trade. I said, all right, we'll trade. You're getting the low end of the deal. I'm getting the high end of the deal there. He laughed. He said, what do you want? I said, I want the portrait of Magritte. He did those fabulous portraits of Magritte. So he had one artist proof left, and he sent it to me which I still have, and uh, it's a real treasure in the collection, I'll tell you. Aaron was just one in a million. He was one of the, the thing about Aaron is he taught poetry for 25 years before he really launched his photo career. He did a lot of, he did photography that whole time, but uh, he was such a well-rounded human being, and uh, what was interesting about the Institute of Design is you had a guy like Aaron Siskin, who certainly had national fame, and then you had a guy like Arthur Siegel, who didn't have the national fame, but he was a really fabulous photographer and quite erudite and historic. I mean, his sense of photo history was phenomenal. Aaron was certainly the lead figure because he was just so generous with people. You know, when students didn't have money, he was buying supplies for them. You'd be invited to Aaron's house. Come over Saturday. We'll talk about let's talk about your work. He'd make you breakfast. You know, so it, it was that kind of a guy. He was just always willing to to give a lot, and his dedication. I mean, you look at the, the volume of work he produced in his lifetime, and how dedicated he was, and his sensitivity of photography. It was, you know, it just all came out. Whether you knew him or not, if you looked at the work and you, you know, was always there. So he was a big influence and, and just a, a wonderful human being. I mean, he just was so generous, so generous with people. You know, and he knew everybody in New York. He knew Franz Klein, and he would badger Franz Klein to get drawings from Franz Klein to, to put in the Institute of Design annual student fund auction which he did every year until Franz Klein died. My first teaching job was actually at Cincinnati Art Museum, and I didn't quite know where Cincinnati was after Chicago, so they flew me down, I interviewed, and I thought, this is pretty impressive to take a, plane, a cab ride from the airport. In those days, they had the wheelie uh, stairwells would wheel up to the plane. You'd get off, and the big sign was, welcome to greater uh, northern Kentucky. So I thought I got off at the wrong spot, and it turned out it was the right spot. Cab drove in through Eden Park. You know, can you imagine looking at Eden Park and going up to the museum when the academy was next to the art museum? And it was, uh, it was pretty wonderful. It was, it was an art school. It, at that time, didn't even have an academic program. So it slowly evolved over time that it started picking up the academic program, degree granting, because it was kind of a Bauhaus kind of oriented school in many ways as much as it really pushed painting and drawing were the mother arts then. Um, the faculty really rotated around. You did foundation, you did drawing, you, you moved around and everything. You taught foundation woodshop, you know, which I had all that stuff in Chicago, so it was a perfect fit for me. And I wanted to be at an art school. I didn't want to be at a university. I think I saw enough of university politics. I go, oh, I'll stay away from that. So I was really happy to be at an art museum related school. Mm -hmm. And in those days, Phil Adams was the director, and he, and you had to be interviewed by the museum director before you got the jo any job at the school. And uh, he flat out just looked at me and said, as long as he's director, there'll be no photography in the collection. They were that against photography. Right around that same time, I probably made my first clothing photographs. And of course, clothing is as close to the body as you can get without the actual body being there. So that was the beginning of working with, with clothing, which I've done on and off for a long period of time. I would work with it, drop it, come back to it. Uh, and in the meantime, I worked with, you know, 
every kind of a imaginable found object. And I think the clothing photographs are um, very much about memory. They're in some ways about loss, although not literally. There's one photogram that's a slip that was belonged to my mother. That was the only one that was literal. And I did a big body of work about clothing, and I said, this is it. I'll never do another dress photogram. I'm done. And about a year later, the artist Joel Otterson, who had had a studio above us in Carl Solway Gallery, gave me all these wedding dresses that had been hanging from the rafters of his studio. And of course, they were way too good to pass up. So I did a whole series on wedding dresses. And then around 2007, I got a grant from the Kentucky Foundation for Women. And I kind of assigned myself to work with clothing that was really characterless. I mean, I got all these funny little dresses and jumpsuits from the Salvation Army. And I started cutting them apart and altering them, which turned into the series Alterations, which was part of what I showed at the Weston last year. Hal had bought, had been collecting candelabras, one at a time. He never bought the double sets. And he was just collecting these nice shapes at flea markets. And, and this is something we did for years, was go to flea markets together and look for interesting stuff. I decided to see what they would look like in a photogram, and they were great. They were really great shapes. Some of the shapes had a kind of Brancusi sculptural feel to them. So I started working with them, and then I started adding some glass to reflect and refract glass off the metal. And it turned into this gigantic series. It's over 30 pieces. Um, and it was right during the whole candelabra series that my paper was discontinued. Some of the most important shows I've had I've actually, have actually been two-person shows with Cal, Cal, my husband. Um, and I think we've had five or six shows together. I've kind of lost count. But we had a small show at Carl Sawa Gallery. And then we had a, a large show at the Cincinnati Art Museum in 2000. Um, we had a show together at the Houston Center for Photography in 2002 and a large show at the Weston Art Gallery in, at the Aronoff Center in downtown Cincinnati in 2003. Um, I've, lo I've forgotten the date. Of, we had a show at um, the Ross Art Museum in Ohio Westland. Uh, I would say that was maybe 2007, 2008, along in there. Um, in terms of solo shows, um, Probably the two largest solo shows I've had were at the Indianapolis Art Center in 2007, and then last year at the at the Weston Art Gallery once again. And in terms of group shows, I'd say the two most important were there was a show about the history of the photogram at the Denver Art Museum that was in the mid 1990s, and the Columbus Art Museum did a show in 1998, um, three contemporary people with Man Ray, and that was a really great show to be in. Once I moved back to Cincinnati in 1992, it still proved to be a great way for me to work. By um, 94, I was working uh, full time for Carl Saleh Gallery. So it was kind of back to the same old, you know, making exposures on weekends and getting into the dark room during the winter. And the dark room for me then was the basement of Cal's house. Uh, and that's, where I, that's how I worked for years and years and years. I've worked for Carl Selway now for 20 years, and my job has been all over the place. I was, um, I would say that the most consistent thing I've done is their logistics. I retired from teaching in uh, 2002, and then uh, I taught at, uh, I did a visiting artist in at Northern Kentucky University, and then when Barbara was on sabbatical, Barbara Houghton. And then I went up to the graduate program at Ohio State for two semesters, two quarters. And uh, that was really, I enjoyed that a lot. After that, I said, the teaching career is over. Now, look what's happened in the photo world. In the early days, you could buy photographs for 25 bucks. You know, Charlie Harper had taught at the Art Academy when he graduated and either they got married and they went out west. And he arranged to meet Edward Weston. And I'll never forget that story. They bought three Edward Western prints for $15 a piece. And those were the days, you know, people traded, you know, exchanged prints and stuff. So 
and look now, vintage prints, you know, who, who can collect? The ease of photography is certainly there, but the question always will remain, is it a strong enough image to really hold up? You know, we can have billions of photographs, as Susan Sontag sort of predicted, but, you know, who's going to go through all of it and sort of edit, you know, edit it down a little bit? But there's room for everybody. I'll hold my breath and wait five years and see, see where the work shows up after that. So, I mean, for what Anita does and what I do, it's sort of so different. There's nothing to be competitive about other than stealing our objects. <laughs> so, you know, we're always well, trying to find stuff. I think one thing that um, really kind of saves us and is something we have in common is that neither one of us sees photography as an isolated medium. I mean, we both really like to look at sculpture. We like to look at painting. We're, um, we like all the arts.